Well, I start with my pre-game thoughts, shall mm -hmm. we? Because I think pre-game, I was incredibly nervous about this game because they're, they're, it was huge. It was very important not, not to lose. At that time, I really wanted us to win. But when I, actually the game went on and we started to see a performance and we started to see our team again, I've come away from it feeling a lot more positive than I thought I would have done about a 1-1 draw away. So went through a few emotions, but I feel a lot better because I think we've seen Arsenal again and the way we used to play. No doubt we'll talk about that and the reasons why. But yeah, for a 1-1, and I, I'm just hoping the last chance is offside, but Tom's telling me it's not. <laughs> so uh, for a 1-1, I'm, I'm OK with it at the moment. OK. Yeah, I, I had an all or nothing feeling mm. pre-game. Mm. I, I really felt like the title rested on this, which for a game in November is, in a way, ludicrous. But that is a result of Arsenal's form prior to this game. And the points that have been dropped, of course, and the feeling around the fan base as well. But... I agree with Clive, and I felt like there was more identity in that Arsenal team performance at Stamford Bridge that had been lacking in previous games. The Inter Milan game was encouraging, but still, that was 46 crosses. And the big chances that we created in this game, while you could argue that Erdogan lofted the ball to the back post, it was it was more direct, there was more thinking behind it than I felt like there was in, in the Inter Milan game. And the chances Martinelli had as well came from kind of these low-driven balls into the box. And it was a lot more controls than I felt it had been in previous games. Yeah, similar for me, I think pre-match, I went into the game thinking this is a must win. Um, I think it's a game that we needed to get three points from. I was encouraged by the performance. I, I thought that um, the Newcastle performance was a disgrace. I thought the Inter Milan performance was better, but still not as good as was made out. I thought for the domination that we had, the possession we had, we didn't actually create anything. There was 40 plus crosses. That's not creating chances. I think Inter actually allowed us onto them. So I think it was a little bit warped in terms of the domination we had in that game. This was uh, an improvement for me because there was actual goal scoring chances that we created. I've not seen that for a while. So I left feeling a little bit, a little bit more enthused by seeing the old Arsenal back, but still disappointed by the fact that we didn't win the game. Chelsea are not brilliant. They're on a good run of form and they've got a good attack, but they're not great. You want to win this title. I think this was the game we had to really come away with three points. And we were so close at the end. We're going to get into that, but <coughs> I do agree. It was nice to see Arsenal back in, in their own way. You could definitely see that, that they were coming into themselves a lot more. And obviously it was nice to have Odegaard back. Do you not feel that we missed him, you can see in yesterday's game? Well, can I take this one first? <laughs> okay, <good. laughs> I, I think because his influence, I didn't realise by how much we missed him. And it started literally from the first five minutes. And the difference is, it's not what he does on the ball so much. We all know he's brilliant on the ball. But it's how he directs the team. Mm -hmm. So as he pushes forward, he's not just pressing the ball in front of him. He's looking behind him and seeing where everyone is and saying, get up, mm. get up behind me. And that's crucial. And that's crucial to chance creation. Because all that does is that creates a, a different line height. Your line height at the back and your line height at the front. If that gap is shorter, the game becomes more compact, it becomes a contest. Arsenal's team is built for the contest, to win duels, to win that contest in smaller spaces, and to be technical in smaller spaces. But if your spaces are too big, you can get run through and pass through. And that's what's happened in previous weeks. We're not able to dominate teams. So Odegaard literally owns our game model. He literally does. And I thought I knew everything about Arsenal, but I didn't realise by how much he influences how I feel watching the team and how our performance goes. I think he's such an important player. Well, it's, it's like having... Arteta's vision on the pitch in a player. Mm. Like you get that sense that he's the captain. There was, I remember there was a lot of talk at the time when he was actually given the captaincy about whether it was the right choice. Mm -hmm. I remember the other candidate at the time was Kieran Tin, mm -hmm. was being talked about as potentially the, the right option. <laughs> you can see how their pathways have diverged massively since that point. And actually, you can see the decision was not only because Zerdegaard, you know, as a leader, the way he talks to the team was good, but it's because he acts a certain way on the field and he demands more from his players. And then he executes passes, plays crosses, plays key passes into key areas. And that's everything that Arteta wants from his team. But when he's not there, as he hasn't been, we've missed him massively. I agree. And I think I look at Odegaard as a bit of an artist. And I love the way that he's always on the half turn. His body shape always is to receive, but also then to hurt. And I think what we've missed with Odegaard not being in our team is that guy that can make that pass and hurt you. For all the qualities that Declan Rice, Marino and Partey have, they haven't got that pass in them. And I think teams know that. 
when you know you've got you've got a midfield that no one's going to really split the defense open. I think you 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 defend us differently when you know Odegaard's on the half turn and can make that pass. I think it affects how they play against us and having him back in that team. Just that threat alone, I think, massively alters how not only we play but how other teams play against us. So it was great to have him um, back in the team for his leadership qualities as well as technically what he brings to our team. We could definitely see he brought his flair back. And that's the thing. We obviously have been, for the last few weeks, have been saying, you know, you can see that Odegaard's missing, but then once he was back, you know, you really could feel this is what we've been missing out on. Even the assists. Who else in our team can really make that pass? Yeah. There's no one... Trossard, maybe. Jorginho, maybe. There's only really Odegaard that can make that pass. So if Odegaard's not there, do we score that goal? You could argue Saka does as well. But he wasn't there, so it had to fall on Erdegaard yeah. to do that. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. yeah. So what, what Erdegaard did there, because he gets the ball and he manipulates it and holds it, mm. he draws people to him. 100%. He draws people to him. Not only does he draw people to him, he allows his own team to get into attacking shape. So when he gets hit, does a little flip flack over the ball, then suddenly an overlap comes. Mm -hmm. He's got it. He needs support. So I start to move. When you create those sort of overloads, it, creates, it freezes people, creates time. And suddenly, there's two people in the back post. We can all see from our set ease, but how does he see it in the crowd and just dinks it straight over? And um, yeah, he's, he's, he's better than I thought. And there are people that were saying, Tommy, you know they're out there, that were saying for a period that we were better when he wasn't mm. on the pitch. Yeah. I want to find those people. <laughs> 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 I need to find them. I think, like, what you said about how Odegaard takes players away, that also has a knock-on effect on Saka because the amount of times teams will set up in a certain way, mm -hmm. will put their left back, their left side, their centre half, their left centre midfielder, all surrounding Saka. If you've got a good enough left back, and Kukurea I thought had a, an okay game, but mm -hmm. Saka was really giving him, you know, threat a lot of the time. But without Odegaard there, as Clive said, like Odegaard pulls people towards him, Saka's pulling people towards him, and that opens up spaces for other players in the team. So that your 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 right centre mid in the case of Odegaard push, Havertz can drop into those spaces as well that open up for him. And I felt like without Odegaard there, and especially against Bournemouth when we had neither of them, mm -hmm. you're looking around, you're looking for where's the space is going to open, who's going to pull people into different positions, and it's not there. But it's not just through their movement, it's through their aura, it's through their presence. And Odegaard and Saka are two players who are of a world-class standard that we just lack the depth to replace when they're not there. And when they're not there, that has obviously a knock-on effect on how the opposition will play against you. I think also as well, it's, it's also the, the wingers, Martinelli and Saka, that benefit from Odegaard being there. More so Saka, because when Odegaard is there, Saka gets double teamed less. Because again, to my point, teams know that Odegaard can make that pass. But Saka also knows I can make that run in behind because I know there's a player on the pitch that can, that can find me and make mm -hmm, that pass. Mm -hmm. So it's not only for the team he benefits, but Saka in particular benefits because he knows I can keep making that run, keep making that run because there's a player there that I know can find me in a way that other players, I just don't think, can make that pass to find Saka in behind.